Okay, uh, hello everyone. This is, um, we think this is going to be a new podcast, and we're going to call it This Week in Thought. And so right now there's there's just two of us. We have another friend of ours who, I don't know, he's not answering our calls this week, not showing up, but uh, it's okay if he, ever, if he ever shows up on this or a subsequent episode, we will introduce him then. Uh, for now though, uh, you, you may know me from my other channel on YouTube called Chunky Time. I'm Chunky, and this is Kasig, introducing Kasig for those that have not uh, seen him online before. And so, yeah, so this is just, we're going to kind of do a podcast probably once a week, and um, really it's, I think, we kind of discuss, we just want to talk about the things we're thinking about, and so this isn't just regular random thoughts like, you know, what video game I watched, or what what stupid thing happened on the news. This is more like what, you know, interesting, maybe, or profound things were we thinking about over the past week? Um, I don't know, we've, we, we've spent a lot of hours over the years talking, you know, talking philosophy, metaphysics, ethics, things like that, things we thought were interesting. And very rarely have we actually recorded it. We did, I guess we did, what, a couple of discussion groups, like, quite a while ago, de- over a decade ago, uh, which were cool. Oh, yeah. They were they were audio only, you know. We never had a camera re- recording uh, back in the day, and so um, yeah, they were short and they were audio only. But so hopefully now we've got this new medium. It's pretty easy for us to do this, and we're, again, we're, it's I, I think we're not really going to plan on like a, a like a strict rigid schedule or try to follow a routine or a topic. It's kind of going to be kind of stream of consciousness. Although I. I think we both sort of have our favorite topics, and we're probably going to explore those as we go. Uh, yeah. I, if I had to guess, it's it's you know it's some metaphysics, but it's it's ethics too. It's probably a lot of aesthetics. So I think that's kind of a common thing. Um, I, Simu- simulation theory. <laughs> simulation theory. Simulation theory. And and what'll be interesting is as we get into it, and Kasich describes it then I'll understand the theory because I don't even think I understand it yet myself. Well, you know, that, that makes, you know, fun. You know, if it was simple, then it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that is what I've heard. Yeah, simple things are no fun. Uh, cool, cool. So I don't I don't even know where to start. I, we should probably acknowledge the, the Christmas tree in the room here. So it's we're recording this the day after Christmas in oh, 2022. Yeah just in case we look back on this in the future and wonder where we were at or what we were doing. And so, uh, so I guess, yeah, we should get started. How was, how was your Christmas? Do you have a good Christmas or? Oh, good, good. You know, typical, um, I'm a night worker now, so I'm up all night. So it's pretty much every night's the same quiet. (laughs) I can sit here in the dark, hang out with the cat. You like the night work better than day shift work? Yeah, yeah, I don't like being bothered. <laughs> right there with you. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't like being bothered either, and so I do a lot of night work too. I don't. It, I'm not like on a set schedule per se. It's kind of just whenever. But I find I end up working middle of the night a lot. Like that midnight to eight a.m. is like a really good productive time. Yeah, getting code written. So. Yeah, right about midnight is when I start getting active. Yeah, same, same, same. Although I, I do miss the sun. <laughs> <laughs> really, Lestat, tell us about that. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I miss sleep, just to catch a couple hours of sunlight. Yeah, sunlight's pretty cool. We haven't had much sun the last couple of days. We had that cold Arctic blast thing, whatever it was. It was snowy and just like well below freezing for a couple days there kind of coming out of it now it's cool yeah hopefully everybody found a place to hide (laughs) yeah i think i think they said by like thursday it's supposed to be up like 60s and rainy (laughs) if you can believe that going from negative (laughs) 10 to 60 well you know that's kind of what they've been warning about it is exactly what they've been warning about and now we're living it yep now we're living it um yeah, cool. I don't know. So it's what? been, you know, maybe should we talk about the year in review, or was it a lame year? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'd rather just move forward. Let's move forward. It was a year. <laughs> we were working. I get, Well, I think we both had work changes in the last year that were good. So that's sure, kind of cool. Sure. No, I have a lot to be thankful for, you know. Yeah. Definitely, definitely do. Yeah. Yep. That being said. Yeah, yeah that being said, let's not talk about work. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I'm not opposed to talking shop if we want to do that in the future. Fine, but I agree. I'm not really like keen on <laughs> deep diving into the world of computers. Yeah. yeah um, anyway, so yeah, I don't know. I we had, you know, we had a pretty good uh, list going there of topics. I'm gonna kind of scroll back and just see. Yeah, but kind of on the theme of you know what the road ahead is. Yeah, right. You know what? And I've got a bunch listed here too, but you had a whole bunch of topics that you had kind of listed. Is there any like topic maybe you wanted to start with? Just kind of scrolling back, looking through that list. Kind of simulation theory, because it kind of, it put everything else, if seen in that perspective, it sort of colors sort of everything. Yeah. What's... You know, if you, if you think that, you know, this is all just not real in sure. some sense, or it's not the ultimate form of reality, it's a sub layer kind of sure uh so when you say simulation theory that would be i just want to make sure i'm correct in understanding that's like the belief that the the universe that we perceive is not it's not a physical universe as we perceive it but instead it's something like a holographic projection run in sort of some alien supercomputer and we are part of that simulation also is that right oh. is that like what that means hey. You know, or, you know, the mind of the universe or, you know, something, you know, it, 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 there are different variations. But, yeah, basically, this isn't as real. Uh, it's not It's not as real as we believe, and it's more malleable by us. That usually goes along with it. Yeah, that's a lot of the, um, a lot of the occult stuff, a lot of the magic with a K, magic paradigm seems to... It seems to talk about, how would you call it, like a placebo effect applied externally, I, I, for lack of a better term. So Yeah, like applied use of that. Yeah, which, Except which makes sense if it's... Effect would be, if you'd have to give it kind of a broad, you know, definition of what the placebo effect could affect. Yeah, right, right. But that's, yeah. Right. I mean, if it's all, if we're all living in the matrix, though, it makes perfect sense why the placebo effect could be applied externally with, you know, consistent results. Sure, sure. That's interesting. Is, in, is that where you're at right now? Do you think we're at, you think it's all a simulation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Although I'm, I am open to the idea that you know, so much of reality is constructed in our minds. It may seem like. It's created because largely it is, but in our minds, you know, there might be an objective reality, you know, physical right. reality. What's your, what's your hunch? Is your hunch that there is an external physical reality that we're perceiving or is your hunch that yeah. now it's all simulation? I think it's a hologram. There might, there might be outside of it, but. Oh, outside the hologram, like in the alien universe where they're running the supercomputer that creating our universe right or it's a different dimension or who know you know it's kind of pointless to speculate yeah i mean that's it's the it's the um the the metaphysical void you know it's all speculative it's interesting sure, but it's not it's tough to test it's tough to get to set up a provable hypo you know hypothesis or whatever sure sure because the edge it's at it's the edge of perception so it i mean you can always push it forward you know the good old scientific method, but well, here's an ethical twist on that for you. Let's say it's true, you know, the simulation hypothesis is correct, and you come to the end of whatever your your uh, simulated life is going to be here, and so now you get a chance to meet, let's say, the makers, <laughs> meet your maker. But it turns out, of course, it's just an alien running it, and they said, okay, now the simulation's over, and we're as, as one last hurrah before we turn you off. We're going to let you ask us questions if you want. Like, what would you ask of those alien creators? Just like a quick history book, like a history for dummies, and then just go off to the corner, read that, and then go from there. Like a history of their civilization and what brought them to the point that they could build a simulation and set yeah. you up as like an agent in it, yeah. Right. Uh, and, you know, 
I, ideally from other cultures or whatever, but, you know, whatever you can, I can get my hands on. And knowing, you know, you got to always look at where information's coming from and sort of work around the skew. Yeah, it'd be but ho- But if they're aliens, hopefully they're benevolent. There's probably a mix. I think if it was just like space predators, they just use some sort of horrible, you know, some sort of something horrible, you know, super tech and, you know, just get rid of us or whatever, you know. It, so it kind of seems to me it's more like a preserve or something. Yeah, I, I highly doubt that advanced aliens are predatory. Maybe not, but I doubt it. I think they got better things to do than be predatory on hairless monkeys on planet Earth. I, you know, I think it's it's probably like psychopaths. It's just sort of all, you know, that couple percent is all through history. Like the type of people who go down foul paths, I guess. I was just mentioning that this, this uh, video editing software I've been using, I can't remember now. Uh, it's like, it's called Shotcut, I think. It's like this open source video editing software. And at first I found it really intimidating just because I have never learned anything about video editing. And then as I started to mess around with it, I would like search on YouTube to try to like look up how-to videos and stuff. And I was learning how to like splice things and like crop sections of video out. And then to take like sections of like long, boring things and speed up the whole section and compress it. Um, and, and so what I learned is that there's all kinds of really cool things that you can do with it. Um, so like, I actually enjoy the video editing. Like at first it was like this daunting task that I found very like laborious and tedious and time consuming. I didn't, I like dreaded doing it. And now that I'm like, feel comfortable with it, I enjoy it a lot. So, so that's kind of cool, I guess. Yeah. That's, it's always great to learn new hobbies or retake up old hobbies. Yep. Totally. Yeah, I think this is kind of the time, you know, after most of the kids are grown, you know, everybody goes, you know what, I think everybody goes back and relives some of their, you know, what they did when they were younger. Yep. Yep. Yeah, totally. Uh, God, it's weird. You know, my daughter's going to be 20 in April. <laughs> that's awesome. That's crazy. I, I don't want to think about how old that's going to make me, but <laughs> older than 20. Yeah. I remember I remember 20 like it was yesterday. I don't know about you, but like I <laughs> I can remember that like it was yesterday. Yeah. Uh cool. So simulation theory, I don't I don't have a a lot of to contribute to it. I because I don't really have anything to prove or disprove it either way. I mean, I think sure. it's it's perfectly plausible. It's consistent with our experience. It could be simulation, it could be not um uh, and, and, you know, I, I really, I guess, uh, I, I can't remember what the term for this is, but it doesn't really bother me either way. Like, it, it so I guess I'm focused more on experience and whether or not that experience sure. is authentic or simulated doesn't, I mean, the net effect is that to me it feels like the same kind of experience. So I don't, you know, sure. I don't really go, begrudge the aliens if in fact they're running us in a simulation or not, or if it's, a, you know, really the third rock from the star that we're orbiting, it doesn't really matter right. to me either way. I don't know. Nice. I, do you, do you have like a do you have like a a take on it? Like a if it's a simulation, then like X Y Z. If if it's a simulation, we might be able to get out of it. If we're trapped in the simulation and and set a bit part of the simulation itself. But I like the idea of a writer writing about characters and the characters rebelling and going and doing their own thing. You know, God, what was that? Did you you ever read uh, Stephen King's uh, Dark Tower series? The whole it was like a seven book series. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I read the whole thing. He, in one of those books, later on, it was like I want to say like book six or book seven. I don't remember. He he sort of explores that a little bit. Where he spoiler alert here. These are twenty year old books, so hopefully <laughs> I'm not spoiling anything for anyone. But he writes himself as a character in his own novel. And then he allows the characters that he's written to interact with the caricature version of himself. But he makes this metaphysical assertion that the character version of himself has the same power over the story that he, the author, has. So as they talk to the character version of himself and suggest that they need assistance, the character version writes the assistance in the form of like he scribbles a note on a piece of paper and then swallows it. The character swallows the note 
and then it's manifest in the story later on as like so, so it's it's sort of like what you're talking about there like a you know an awareness of your own place in the scheme of a story it's kind of interesting well with the two i would assume you could make a version of yourself like an idealized version like the always eats one's vegetables and such <laughs> And slowly over That's time, ideal. Oh, <laughs> we have very different ideas of what ideal is. No, you you know, know, sorry, go ahead. And have different, like, a slight variation of your name. And you, when you're operating in that mode, you're operating in that name. And then over time, you transition from the lower name to the higher name. I wonder if that's, like, a self-induced origin of schizophrenia. <laughs> I'm sure it's a risk. It's a risk. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'd certainly say if one was prone to such things, that's probably not a good... What's up with Bob? I don't know, he started calling himself Bub, and things just sort of went downhill from there. <laughs> Sitting over in the corner talking to himself. What's up, Bob? Not much, Bub. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it depends on how one defines ideal. Yeah, no lie. <laughs> God, no lie. Jeez. Friggin' tiger blood I, and such. <laughs> yeah. You know, that that's interesting, how you define ideal... I used to think I knew what ideal circumstances were or, you know, for society or life or whatever. Man, the older I get, I don't think I know anything. I I don't know what's ideal. Like, every state seems to have benefits and drawbacks, and I don't know that I can judge them as being more or, you know, one more or less valuable than another. Do you have, like, an ideal state? Like, you go, oh, things like this right now aren't ideal because I would want to change this or that aspect or I'd want to create this ideal, you know reality or civilization or whatever i don't care for stress so once i i'm trying to learn how to lessen that through whatever means necessary not whatever means but sure sure yeah i hate stress too i i don't know what's a good thing i will say that i i'm kind of in the same boat where i think stress is probably the biggest the biggest detriment to the quality of life for me that i have right now like the biggest detractor from that sure and it's and poison. so it, I, I, meditation helps, um, yeah. sleep just, I, I don't seem to sleep as well as I used to. Like if I can get a solid six or eight hours of sleep, that helps me a lot. And then sometimes like, um, oh, I wanted to say thanks. I forgot to tell you, thank you for, uh, th my guitar that you had been holding on to. And oh, then sure. you, you gave it back to me a couple weeks ago or a month ago. Uh, and I started to play guitar for like the first time in 20 years again. And, um, I forgot how de-stressing that is because it when I get into the mode of playing guitar it sort of takes me out of a conscious awareness of my body and I get sort of lost in the music you know I'll just put on headphones and so I'm like playing an electric guitar so they don't really hear much they just hear the little acoustics but I'm hearing the whole thing in my headphones and so then it's it's like you know it, it takes you to like this <laughs> alternate musical reality where you don't think about your body and the pain and the suffering and stresses and exhaustion and all the other stuff I, I at least i do i can kind of get lost in the music and i love that i love doing that so music there's a de-stress like oh well, sure technique. sure i read a lot that helps fiction or non-fiction uh, mostly like sci-fi any like favorite authors these days that not really i've been reading a lot of uh it's a genre called um lit rpg so it's about characters in games or the world's turned into a game or that's those are pretty common topics in the genre. And in that genre, do the characters in the story realize that they're in a game? Yes. Oh, interesting. In, in some in some of them it's actually broadcast out to all the the super, you know, the multiverse. Huh. That is interesting. And are they are the characters typically pissed off that they're characters in a game and not like authentic is that like part of the plot or... oh yeah yeah and and some and usually like some outside force has made it so that these people have like a unique advantage just so that they can attack the super powerful ais which is usually what it is wow that is matrix like that is matrix like with the oracle but giving it, neo the key but instead of like one planet like the ai controls galaxies and universes yeah that's cool that's really cool did you ever read that short story uh 
by Isaac Asimov. It's called The Last Question. Great short story, by the way. No. It's uh, it's all about it's all about how do you um, the humans the humans are building their primitive AIs, and the question that they ask it is how do we how do we sidestep heat death of the universe? So mm. second law of thermodynamics says you know we're burning th the universe is burning through potential energy, and it's it's as it consumes it entropy increases so the the amount of available potential energy for work is diminishing. So that given enough time, the universe eventually burns out into like the state of like cold equilibrium. Um, and and so the, the humans ask, it starts out as like a tongue in cheek thing, like the technicians or the engineers are like, oh, how do we how do we circumvent the second law of thermodynamics? And the AI is like, I don't have enough information to answer that yet. And then it <laughs> goes through like like thousands and millions of years of, of evolution of the humans, but also the computers, the AI is getting better and better. And it turns out that every descendant AI was working on the last question and trying to get nice. to it. And so the humans would keep asking it, hey, how do we suck about the second law of thermodynamics? Well, eventually, the humans move on. <laughs> you know, the humans go, like, they they move into, like, a, a subspace or whatever as consciousness entities. But, no, but the, the AI is left behind. It's like this super powerful AI, just like what you're talking about. And the, finally, in the very end of it, the AI is like, Oh, I, f I finally have an answer to how we circumvent the second law of thermodynamics. And and they're like, okay, so what is it? And the computer goes, let there be light. <laughs> so nice. the implication that humans <laughs> created the AIs, which in turn become the god of the next cycle of the rebirth of the universe, implying sure. that if that happened happens in the future, why didn't it happen in the past? And if it happened in the past, maybe we're just the result of... <laughs> The AI is created by humans in the prior iteration of the universe. It's an interesting, very interesting. Oh, sure. And, you know, the, you know, the idea of, t of time being a loop and a you know, giant cycle of cycles is kind of a hallmark of civilization. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to remember the, uh, what, do you remember, you probably remember the Indian philosophy. I can't remember now. They had, they have the idea that, we go through a series of uh, ages called yugas, Y-U-G-A-S. Yep. Right, right, and we're in the Kali Yuga. We're in the bad one now, the last one, the, the short one that's all the bad stuff happens and is the final decay, but at the end of the Kali Yuga, it's like reborn into the next golden age of, I can't remember what the golden age is in the next Yuga cycle. Right, right. Hopefully, you know, it. hopefully it's on its way. Yeah. What theory was that, or what, was that, is that B Buddhist, or, or no, it's the other one, it's like... Hindu? Yeah, I think it's Hindu. It's I like it's Hindu, Hindu, yeah. Like Hin like Hindu cosmology. Which, you know, it did wouldn't surprise at all, especially if it is a simulation. <laughs> that you know, it, it brings astral it puts astrology in a new light. Because like, could you imagine if someone made a simulation but they made like clues that it was all nonsense? <laughs> you just oh, right, figure right. out you just figure out the secret pattern. It's it's like every like every D and D game world you've ever created, and then you're like, wait a minute, this has all the earmarks of a lazy DM. <laughs> that pattern shouldn't be there. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. This plot armor is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> I should not still be alive after the shit I just did. You nerfed those rolls, didn't you? I rolled a one, didn't I? And you flipped over to a twenty, didn't you? That's why I kind of stay. I'm a homebody these days. It's like you know, you hit blackjack enough times it's like i think it's time to go <laughs> enjoy my winnings <laughs> sure sure you mean it in like the metaphysical lottery that's yeah like close that. calls <laughs> right right yeah i think now i'm getting ready to, i think i'm going to buy some land and try to grow my own not all my own food but a good portion get some sustenance um stuff i could sell like um there, there are a bunch of options yeah Depending on what you're selling, if you've got things that are like, um, what do they call them, like cash crops or bumper crops, like th things sure. that, that you'll you'll produce more than you'll actually use, so you could, I don't know. Actually, I yeah. don't know. I don't know what a good, like, we're, just for the viewers, we're in Missouri, so I don't know what a good cash crop in Missouri is. I don't know what yeah. grows real well here. I'm guessing there's something. Yeah, it's a whole learning process. I'm in the middle of learning the basics of gardening and it's good to know i do you think now we're coming up on the year 2023 do you think that that'll be the year that you start to 
get the land and start putting that plan in place, or is it is this like a preparatory year and then it'll be after that? Depends on the market, really, and depends on what's available. Um, but I'm already sort of getting ready, like taking sort of t going through boxes, consolidating, getting rid of stuff, you know, putting ev putting that stuff aside, ready to go. So yeah, hopefully in the year would be nice. You know, yeah. at least have a couple acres where I can have somewhere to camp. Sure, sure. I love that idea. I, I wonder, do you think you're going to build a cabin on it or have a cabin built or something? Or Yes, although I might end up buying a house closer to town, in which case that might just be for tent camping. Boy, it'd be nice to just have like a fire pit <laughs> and then woodland around on, sure. your, on your rural land. Heck yeah, go out there when it's nice or maybe get um, like a pull behind stove or whatnot. Yeah. That's awesome. I really hope you get to do that. I would love to do that also. I, we're not quite ready to do that. We got we got house renovations we're getting done, getting like offices built in the basement, so that's probably this year. And then my daughter's got another couple years of college, so we're probably hanging out for a couple more years. After that, yeah, I don't know. I will probably at some point downsize. We've been in this house now like, God, 20, almost 22 years we've been here. Yeah, that's like, awesome. I, is it, though? It's a little, I mean... I guess it's good that yeah we have a house and we've had one for that long, but man, it. I would say we're in a to say we're in a rut is like an understatement. Although well, the that, thing is, where do you go? Like we talk about it all the time, it's like we you know with the housing market the way it is, we can't really afford much else, right. and yeah. we're in a pretty good neighborhood, so I don't know where we would go neighborhood wise. Although if if there's what do they call that a recession next year, it might drive that housing market down. Yeah, so it's tough to sure. figure. Yeah, sure. Tough to figure it out when y'all can be adventurous, you know. Just pick a, you can get a houseboat. <laughs> <laughs> Those are expensive, by the way. I think oh, they're real expensive. Oh, some of them. So, um, six I figures, aren't they? One. Like six figures, low, low to mid six figures, like one fifty to two hundred or two fifty. You know, I would check again. There are some good deals. Really. <laughs> That's a few holes. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sure there's a few deals. Uh, recently I, retrieved from the depth of the lake. Yeah. I, I think it's too humid. It would be freezing here in the winter. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, houseboat is an interesting idea. I, I think my wife's more interested in like owning property where... She, the house would be like near to water so she could go out on a boat from time to time sure. and then otherwise come back to dry land to live like a rowboat or something well probably more like a, maybe a pontoon boat maybe a fishing boat depending on the size of the lake sure but like have your own little dock so you could and then probably you'd need a dry dock because i think you're not supposed to let those sit all winter it's kind of a trick in missouri because we get the four seasons and it hits us hard every every season hits us hard so like you got to be prepared to like dry dock i think all your stuff in the winter to keep it from rotting cracking and freezing and all that kind of crap i don't know yeah, that's why I want, that's why i want to learn earth bag construction because you could build a shelter you know a pretty well insulated shelter fairly cheap where yeah. earth bag uh, earth bags are just kind of uh, long flat sandbags and you cover it with a coat of concrete interesting and then but you can build, what do you do for the roof? It, you can build domes and stuff. You can build um, um, like a whatever type, you know, like a a long sheet on a short, uh, like a triangle. What do they call that? The triangle where it's uh, one long end. Yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about. I don't know the term. I've been collecting blueprints for cabins for a while. Oh. <laughs> I got to finally actually draw up, a plan, you know, crude plans. Yeah, Crayon. <laughs> I'm interested in like stone stone cottage type stuff, uh, and I I don't think I have the patience or the skill to do like um, like masonry quality stone work. But I've been reading yeah. about slip slip form stone work. Do you ever read about that? Where you basically just building the two walls, and then you're you're putting yeah. like aggregate and pouring concrete into it, and then you're building it section by section. You move it. It's kind of interesting. And they Could say you, even an amateur can do it. Don't they have like wood combinations where it's a wood frame and you fill in the walls with brick or stone? Probably. I'm not familiar with that, though. Um, 
I, I've seen where it's they've got like a stone foundation and then they do, you know, either logs or timber, you know, or, or dimensional lumber above it, like on top of it, uh, which is also interesting. I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of a... I, I guess I like both, but not so much in combination. Like I like one or the other. I don't know. I don't know which I would do. I sure, I'm, I'm just thinking from. I don't know what the cost factor would be or what the benefits. But I was thinking, you know, you build timber frame like a square for a wall, and then you put like wire, and then you use that as the base for like flat stones in with in with concrete or mortar, or however you. And then the opposite side of the wall, you do the same thing. Sure. Sure, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. I don't know. It's it's that's a project, man. That's like an ambitious thing. When you go, okay, I'm gonna like let's say build my own whatever yeah. on my property, and I and, and you know if I did that, it'd be a multi-year project, just something to right. Um, you know, build, you know, pour, you know, do four columns, build the roof. <laughs> And then just sort of fill everything from the top down. Yeah, that'd be interesting. That'd be interesting. I um, want to build um, where it's a wooden cabin, sort of set in a hollow of a hill. And then you use earth to fill the walls in, in like a berm up against the walls uh, uh, to um, insulate. Sure. You know, have channels to capture water. and. Yeah, just what you were mentioning there. I've been reading a lot about these um, the design strategies for architecture of uh the lunar colonies that they're going to be building pretty soon. Oh, sure. And, and they're talking a lot about that. Like, you know, they get, they'll send up habitat modules probably and set them on their side, but then they're going to use like, um, hopefully like remote control robotic construction vehicles to be able to push regolith up onto it and to basically create like berm shapes around the, the habitats to protect against like solar radiation and meteorites, micrometeorites and stuff like that. And it's really cool. I'm really into, really into that, and I would love to do that. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, my wife and I have been talking about this. Let's say, let's say that NASA developed something like that, where they said, you know, we've we've sent a fleet of let's say builder bots up to the moon, um, mm -hmm. and now what we want is just regular old average people in their downtime to be able to like volunteer and maybe you'll work for an hour, and you'll get on. We'll give you an app where you can. Remote, you do like a connection to a builder bot and do, and then remote control pilot it and then help to build infrastructure on the moon, harvesting right. things or, or, you know, building up walls or whatever for habitat. Like, is that is that interesting? Because I, I find that very oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, set it, set it up like a game or, you yeah. know, even with the game interface, right? missions, all that stuff. I, I, I think you can do a lot with the game, with the idea of like education and games. You know, where, okay, you're going to play this game for an hour, then this game for an hour, and this game for an hour, and that's your curriculum. Yeah. And do all the instruction. I think computers, that's one thing. Computers are going to take over AIs. Teaching. You'll have, like, one teacher for 50 schools, and it'll be, like, answering support tickets. You know, this kid's having a problem with quadratic equation. You know, you pop in, hey, here's how you do it. And the rest of the day, the kids would just be doing their, you know, going through the games. Interesting. I think it'd be a great way to teach. You know, like if you're learning music theory, have like, you know, here's a virtual keyboard, you know, here's the notes, play the notes, hmm. Th throw some sticks and carrots in. Yeah. Yeah, we, I guess we were trying that a while ago. We pulled down one of those apps that helps you do like um, learning a foreign language again, either like sure. relearning one you took or like learning other ones from scratch. And I, I was playing that a while uh for, I was playing it for a while, um, mm -hmm. just just taking different languages that were interesting to me and kind of studying them. Um, it's it's very time consuming, and I remember now how much work it is to go through something like learning a language. And so e yeah. even though it, you know I was making progress and stuff, um, no matter how much little incremental progress you make, there's this vast amount of additional work in front sure. of you with a language especially just to try to like pick up vocabulary and context and shit um and at some point i was kind of like damn this is why i don't go to school anymore <laughs> that's a hell of a lot of work and 
and the, it's a, it's to me it's like a it's like a cost benefit thing. You go, okay, I'm gonna spend a shit ton of time and energy, like brain power, thinking about this and learning this, and then what do I get out of it? So let's say I achieve it after a thousand hours of study or whatever. I'm fluent in this language. Well, I don't travel anywhere. <laughs> I don't talk to people in other languages. So I'm kind of like, uh, it's not really a skill I want to gain. And so I kind of stopped. My main concern is that within four or five years, there's going to be instantaneous translation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that too. <laughs> so, I mean, there there are reasons to, let, you know, broad, you know, it, it changes right. the way you think. So I'm, I'm good with teaching it. Yeah. Not, not me teaching it, it being taught. <laughs> But yeah, it, it's. Well, I, I I think probably the motivation for me, like I was, I was looking at like Greek and Latin, um, because yeah. I figure well, those are fundamental languages from like antiquity, where if you mastered the language, in theory you yes. could go back to source documents, read them in the original language, and maybe you would pick up on subtleties that you wouldn't get in a translation. Yes. It, but again, it's like, okay, that's a lot of work to go just so I can find a hypothetical antiquated document that may or may not be relevant to something that's interesting to me. It's like, uh, I don't know that I want to commit hundreds or thousands of hours just to do that. And, and you know, to the people who do that, and that's their, the fun of their day, awesome. Please enjoy. Yeah. You're doing a wonderful, important job. <laughs> what, are those linguophiles, or what's the... There's a term for people like that who they're... Or, or, I can't remember if there's a term like that. People that yeah, love the, language, languages sure. and learning language. Yeah, more yeah, different word than linguist probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right, so actually, you know what? That's a really interesting topic now that you're talking about it is you talk about like let's say continuing education cuz I agree with you that it's great to have a lifelong sort of motivation to keep learning things just to, cause, so you're because you, otherwise you stagnate you get in a rut and a good way to get out sure. of a rut is to go well let me just try something new and do something new um so let's say you had like a whole a whole gamut of possible subjects or skills or something in front of you what what would be your choice of of skill or topic to pursue if you had a lot of time and you wanted to like go gain mastery in a new thing probably key gong and that's because I, I, I was doing some exercise uh chinese like energy work okay i was doing some of it last night and had excellent results so it's one of those things where you know when people are looking for reproducible results it's a good place to start because you're you know re-regulating your body's functions you know you're just sort of hijacking the biology which appeals to me if you're in a simulation it's like how do we use the tools given to hack out of this and <laughs> Interesting. But, you know, you got to have fun. You got to have fun. You do have to have fun. You do have to have fun hacking your way out of the simulation that you're being held in against your will unwittingly. Right. Supposedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Oh, uh, right, right. <laughs> Although there are, you know, there are theories saying we volunteered for it all, so. Wow. So, so it's <laughs> like the Stockholm Syndrome of metaphysical imprisonment? That's a hell of a theory. Holy shit. It, it, it takes a mental gymnastics. It takes something. <laughs> it, you know, if, that, if 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 that happens to be true, might have been not the wisest decision. Because <laughs> a lot of the stories talk about this being like a very dangerous realm where this like stuff would just disappear. And as spirits, everybody's like, well, let's go investigate it. And this is kind of the result. <laughs> the spirits trapped in matter and well, that just sounds like Gnosticism now. Uh, well, sure, and that's kind of where I think that we bring the divine into Earth to raise Earth up. And it's a painful process, but an important one. You know, given a mission, it kind of takes the sting out of it, you know, for me at least. Interesting. Bring the divine. So do you think there is such a thing as divinity out there somewhere in the reality that we may or may not be able to access directly? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think everything is, so... Oh, everything. So it's 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 what would you call it? Pan divinity. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, uh, probably pantheism. I think. Pantheism, got it. Where, and there's the other one where I, I think all all divisions are uh, false divisions or not real. It's a well, that's monism. Uh, it, that sounds like. 
Yeah, yeah, it's one one thing, one, but it's also th one thought, so it's idealism too, I guess. Metaphysical idealism, yep. All the way down to Gnosticism. <laughs> it's, I think, what did the Buddhists say? It's just turtles all the way down. Turtles all sure. the way down. <laughs> sure, yep. I, okay, interesting. So everything's divine, which means you're divine, and you're also part of everything, so all these, all the, the distinction that we believe that we perceive is all illusory in your uh, monistic view of metaphysics uh, yeah, yeah it's just perspective interesting interesting facet of a crystal all the descriptions that have been used okay so so all right that's a that's a metaphysical framework i, I grant you that um so what's the ethical implication of the metaphysical framework what's what is the call to action if in fact that's an accurate depiction of reality as accurate as any depiction is and that's when it gets to it depends on who you ask it you know, well, i'm yeah. asking you what's what's I, your call to action from it kind of this just you know giving out meditative advice or whatever you know just different methods that have worked for me you know hopefully we'll make a super big internet presence yes that, or you know yeah. what you know if it's stored somewhere it might be you know, an archaeological find of the aliens who find our destroyed culture. <laughs> and, you know, maybe it'll, be use maybe it'll be useful to them. You know, it's the optimism that really keeps bringing me back <laughs> for these discussions. Well, you know, it's some things are just math. <laughs> Is that what you call your pessimism? Got it. Good old mouth is... The mathematicians may be depressed. It's like how much ca how many calories do each person eat per day? <laughs> Times eight billion. <laughs> yeah, but if it's all simulation, those aren't real calories; those are virtual calories. It, sure, but it's a pretty real simulation. So. Oh, I see, I see. It's real when I want it to be real, <laughs> but it's all bullshit when I'm tired of dealing with all the reality. It's quite a metaphysical mental, framework. Mental flexibility. Is that what they call it? <laughs> Got it. Good to know. All right. Well, so that we've solved metaphysics, I think. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and the call to action is talk about it and share the spread the good news to the, uh, the news. The what? What news? I'd say the news. The good news. The is news. Probably. Don't use the G word. Cool. OK, that is interesting. I, I you know, before we go into my theories on things we should probably explore yours more because i got a feeling that that's just kind of scratching the surface that's that's just the metaphysics which is i think we agree is speculative but it seems like there's a lot more ethics though that oh yeah follow yeah. from that i i think if everyone or if everyone's one then probably living together and getting to, along together and not warring and murdering each other small stakeo collectivism is seems to be the way to go well I, I think we agree on that. Um, small scale collectivism. I'm interested when you say that. What what scale you're talking about? What size community do you mean? I just go with Lao Tzu. Loved what do you say? Like 150. That's probably like 150. Your closest friends, or like 150 might like minded thinkers that agree to live in the same area. I think he said 150 is the maximum limit, and just left it at. Well, I'm saying for you. So what what would those oh. 150 people be? Like friends, like minded thinkers. How do you find the 150 to make a community? I, I I'd figure it would have to be there'd have to you'd have to have some some sort of mechanism to say hey this just ain't working out. And by like, th I, this you mean a larger society that we're living uh, in? No, I'm mean, allowing individuals to stay. Like if somebody becomes oh. a problem. Oh, so you saying find 150, and then when one of them's an asshole, the hundred the other 149 vote on it, kick out the 150th, and find a new 150th candidate who's not an asshole. Right. Right. Okay, got it. I, th I think in Switzerland they actually vote like there's a, a book that goes around and like this all the people on the street and then you vote like you have to actually be voted to get citizenship in Switzerland by your neighbors <laughs> Jesus man talk about popularity contests well and you know all of that whenever people get up to the moon and anytime in space like authoritarianism is kind of given to be the how it goes out there like they're not going to let people do independent space travel because who is they us i would oh, someone because <laughs> maybe the ai robots that you know, ah. gain sentience but you can't just have people flying around nilly-willy out there because it's going to be more like air travel here where it's because 
let, let's say you get in a vehicle and slingshot it around, I don't know, one of the Lagrange points or whatever, and swing it back. By the time it gets to where it's going, it's picked up a lot of speed, like comet hitting the Earth type. <laughs> or like just running into a space station out there. That's, you know, any collision out in space is catastrophic. Sure, but it, isn't it an enforcement problem? I mean, you can make all the rules sure. in the world, but if there's no one out there to enforce it, it's really at the mercy of whatever the people want to do. Right, right. So you just control the fuel points. Or I the, mean, you say yeah. just control it, but if they're the ones, they're the boots on the ground and you're a million miles away, how do you control anything? You Don't you just yeah. sort of leave it up to their hands? You just go, well, we'd like well, you that, to do this, but you're going to do whatever the hell you want to do anyway. Yeah, yeah, until they'd have to be self-sufficient. Yeah, I think I think they people tend to be compliant when they're dependent. And yep. once people achieve independence, and I think this is true on Earth, out in the stars, wherever, once they achieve independence, yeah, that obedience shit goes right out the window. <laughs> yep. I, I think I think humans find find uh, authoritarianism um, repulsive in any context, and they just tolerate it in those where they feel it's necessary to get what they need to survive. Yeah. Until they, until they don't have to anymore. Right, right. Nope. So, yeah, that's cool. That's kind of cool. So, anyway, we were talking about a colony of 150 people on Earth, and those would be like 150 like-minded thinkers. Mm. Now, how, I'm curious, would you set it up as like, because it, it's, it's, and I don't want to, I know this term has like connotations and it, people get it in their mind and they start thinking certain things about it historically, but the term co commune, <coughs> excuse me, commune comes to mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And so it's it's like a large commune, 150 people, but communes typically are not, they don't exist independently of nations, let's say. Like you find oh, communes yeah, yeah. in the U.S. and like maybe they'll be out in sort of, you know, a, a low populated area, you know, out on the plains or whatever, mountains, sure. whatever, but they're still within the national boundaries and therefore under the national, you know. Sure structure you know control structure of the whatever nation now how how would you how would you architect your your micro society so that it sort of doesn't grind gears with the nation that it lives oh. within yeah, follow the laws of the whatever whatever state it's in yeah follow the laws i i'm talking more about the more about the um the economics of it so if you're oh, a commune I, you've got to pay taxes on your land sure. and on everything makes, that you manufacture and sell yeah. Yeah, make make stuff, pay taxes, do it all by the book. Have as much as you can online and freely available to take a look at. Like if you can, if 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 in theory you could keep your books open and on the open and on online, what, go what, for it. What would be your subsistence crops and what would be your oh, bumper crops they, first? Yeah, it's hard to say. It all depends on the people, like what their skills are. Like you can make soap. Uh, the the commune in Missouri makes um, like almond butter and stuff like that. What like uh, if you were going to set one up? What do you think your products would be for subsistence and then for surplus for to make your money to pay your taxes and stuff? I really don't know. I mean, it, it uh, you could do food trucks would be a way to do it. You make you grow the food on your you grow the food in your commune. You make farm to table meals and just. You know, take them out and sell them. This is probably sound a little crazy, but what about a server farm? <laughs> you got sure. high-speed internet to your commune, and let's say you've got solar or some sort of renewable energy generation. Power is really what you need. Yeah. There's, there's the startup capital, the investment capital, but it'll pay itself off over time. If you get somebody to fund it, you know, you can pay it back in spades. And you build a server farm. And now the server farm doesn't take a break. It works 24-7. And you get to bill your customers for the rack space, which means you've got a constant revenue stream. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was looking at a company that does uh, online um, customer service calls. You could do that as long as you make sure that everybody actually does it instead of just the neophyte, you know, <laughs> the, the way that you don't want it to become a cult, you know. And, and, <laughs> awesome. And, and I think that. Guys, we really wanted to make sure this commune doesn't become a cult. You know what happened with the last five that we set up? <laughs> you know, that's one movie they need to remake, uh, uh, Lord of Illusions. Have you ever seen that? No, I don't think I have. Uh, uh, this one, uh, it involved a cult. I'll, uh, <laughs> it, 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 sure, sure. Yeah, it, it was a good horror, it, good horror movie from the 90s, I guess, 80s. But I don't, I, I, I'll leave the description. I'm sorry, what was the, what was the, 
movie name again? Lord of Illusion. Lord of Illusion. Uh, I who think, was in it? Do you remember? Because maybe if you say I, the actor, I'll remember. It'll jog my memory. I, th I think it's got Scott Bakula as a oh. stage musician. So he was the protagonist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and this was oh, a long like, time ago, so he was really young, like yeah. in the eighties. Okay. Yeah, who I was think the it was antagonist. Chen. Do you remember? Uh, the, the cult leader. I mean, what actor or actress? Oh, I, I, I don't. Oh. I don't know. But um, it was a John Carpenter, I think. John Carpenter. Good movie, though. Good movie. But yeah, you always got to set. I'm asking these questions as if I don't have a global digital information network at my fingertips. Lord of Illusion. <laughs> Sorry, let me just... Lord of Illusions, plural, maybe? Oh, that could be, yeah. Uh, let's see. Clive Barker? Oh. Scott uh, Bakula? Kevin D. O'Connor, yeah. Fomke Jansen, Daniel Von Bargen? It's not as good as uh, where they're out in space, and they all consider it a prelude to Warhammer uh, 40K. Um, if you're talking about Event Horizon, I love Event yes. Horizon. Yes, good movie. Yeah. I love that movie. It's like my favorite space horror. It's like all the colors of the rainbow come together in that cool movie. Oh, nope, that's not it. Sorry. It's like that Alien and Aliens are kind of the top of that genre. I, You know, Alien, the first one from 1979, I still think is my favorite as an absolute like classic of horror, like horror in space. Yep. And I, I, I don't know about you, but that Alien franchise, I watched, I think, all four or five movies or whatever, and I really thought, generally speaking, they sort of declined in quality as they went along. Uh, the, the fourth one, the one resurrection where it's got Winona Ryder and now Sigourney Weaver's older, and they like, they, like, resurrect Sigourney Weaver out of stasis, and then she's, like, teaching the younger Winona Ryder and that group sort of how to be survivalists against, like, the ultra... Yeah you know, tough, tough aliens that they're dealing with. Uh, that wasn't bad. Or maybe she was a clone or something. I don't remember. The, the Ripley character was like a clone or something. It, it might have been both. It, it got confusing. Yeah. <laughs> but that first one, man, I love that first one. And then the big reveal in that first one where the one guy ends up being a robot and you don't know it until he gets, like, sliced open mm -hmm. and he's, like, oozing the white, like, the synthetic gel or whatever instead of blood. It's so cool. Yeah. So cool. You know, uh, uh, Prometheus was good. Yeah, I I liked that one too. I think we're in the minority. I don't think a lot of people like those newer ones, <laughs> and maybe that's just critics. But uh, yeah. I liked it a lot. Prometheus, and then what was the one after it? Twenty twelve film. Oh, a sequel, Alien Covenant. Maybe that was the one that people didn't like. Oh uh, yeah, I don't think I like that one. I wish I could remember now, man. What was the? But I'm kind of excited that they're going to make Warhammer 40k. I don't know if it's going to be a show or what. The yep. video game? Warhammer 40K? Well, that and they have, um, they do the tabletop where they got by the miniatures. But I think they have a tabletop RPG, too. But you're talking about they're going to make a, something out of it? Uh, yeah, some some sort of project. They got the dude who plays Superman and the Witcher. So I hope they'll probably get a bunch of money to do whatever they're doing. Are you talking about film? or? Uh, they, they, they haven't decided yet. I think they said TV show, so. TV show. But I, I like the universe. The universe is interesting. Yeah. There was stuff out of Warhammer that I think they lifted from Frank Herbert. Like I think there oh. was a character that they sort of said resembled the God Emperor. Well, I think in I... fact it is called the God Emperor. Oh, is it? Well, okay. So that's yeah. Frank but I think that guy, I think the God Emperor in this one is its mind is living, but it's living in like a mummified, artificially kept alive body, and has been for thousands of years. <laughs> yeah. The real God Emperor, the original God Emperor from Dune, is still like my favorite character in all of science fiction. Yes, love that character. And you know, it the whole the whole of the story, and once you realize the threat, it really makes a lot of all the terrible things done, and at least it offers an explanation. You know. Well, he says, yeah, I'm trying to remember um, that character Leto. He says at one point in the series something to the effect of. Um, if people are if people are bound together and he says even if you know even if you're bound to get you know what what did he say you've spread out across the galaxy so even though you're you are um across you know parsecs of distance in space you're you're still bound by a common behavior and a common you know there's a common thread to all of you meaning you're all connected and he said the problem is that if if i can find the scattered bits of you everywhere you are 
so can other things that have nefarious intent, which means you can all share a common fate. And to me, that's like, you know, very true from like a species survival standpoint. If, if we value our species and we want it to survive, man, it, it strikes me that we've got like two priorities as a civilization. The first is we need to clean up the planet. We need to do all that direct carbon capture stuff and, yep. and get the global warming under control. But man, that's just step one because we still have no plan if a comet is coming for the planet. And so it's mm. like step two ought to be we need to be colonizing the moon. We need to be colonizing Mars like as quickly as possible with as many people as possible just so that if something happens to one planet, we don't lose right. the whole civilization. Well, I think because can, I like I like the civilization enough I'd like to see it continue. I, I think you can do things like build underground cities, you know, set supplies back in. Yeah. And you, know, you, do, you do it where it'll cover a lot of a lot of bases. Like during the Cold War, out in Kansas, they had salt mines where they stored food, just tons of food. Right. And in case, you know, in case something bad happens, you know, you can mobilize, which I can't imagine trying to fight a war after that, you know, thousands of missiles fly. But Oh, yeah. I think there would be people trying. <laughs> I, you know what I would love is I would They'd love be to fighting just... for food, too. Sorry. Sure. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I actually interrupt, but I, as I'm listening to what you're saying there, I'm thinking, yeah, and there's the whole you know, build the infrastructure so you can rebuild after the collapse. Um, I'm not, I have this, it's very strange, I don't know why, I have this newfound, and I'm starting to think that, you know, they always say that, I can't remember, there's a quote, and I can't remember who the author is, but he says something like, you know, it, it, civilization, it might have been Bertrand Russell, he says civilization's a constant race between, like, our technological advancement and and our wisdom, our, the growth of our wisdom to learn how to use it. And if sure. the one gets too far, basically, if the one gets too far ahead, we'll destroy ourselves because we'll have the ability to destroy ourselves without the, the wisdom to regulate it properly. Um, but I have this newfound optimism where I feel like we're, we're starting to come to grips with our technology and we're learning better and better how to, how to harness it. We're learning things like how to in, impose limits on how we use the technology and, and how to apply it in ways that aren't as self-destructive as it had been used, let's say, in the earlier periods of industrial society. It seemed like we, technology was advancing so rapidly, we were just exploding with like industry growth, and we weren't thinking about the consequences of mass industrialization. And I feel like now we're sort of seeing it, you know, we're seeing it with global warming, and we're, we're gaining the technology to move out into the stars, we're building things like AIs, but we're also going, hey, should we? What should we be doing? How should Ooh, we be right. treating the environment? How should we be building the AIs? How should we be colonizing space? Um, and, and that wisdom, that every time I see that sort of like temperance, uh, um, I, I get like uh, my faith in humanity restored a little bit. And I'm sure. like, well, shit, if they're able to do that. I mean, we've had, think about it, as a civilization, humans have had weapons of mass destruction for like three quarters of a century or maybe a little more than that now. Right, and, right. and yet they've only used two of them in 80 years in, in wartime. They did a bunch of tests, but they never used any in a war scenario since then. And it's like, I mean, the, mir the, the fact that we're alive and haven't had to survive a World War III, that's a miracle. And, but that yeah. miracle should tell you something about the resilience of humans from the wisdom standpoint, where they go... Eh, maybe we shouldn't use this. Maybe let's not use that, and let's just <laughs> well, cooperate and, um, or, or whatever. You know, I I I, th I thought that if World War Three happened, uh, nuclear exchange would be inevitable. But look at World War One. You know, World War One had chemical weapons all over the place, and it wasn't used in World War Two, even when you know Germany was Ger Russia was being destroyed, then Germany was being destroyed. You know some pretty desperate times and they didn't release them then. So maybe that precedent will hold when the next big one comes. Because humans are pretty much good at murder. You know, the, the whole murdering each other thing, it supports too many people for... Yeah, it's cooked in the DNA. They Even if you get rid of all the, the official war, you still have to have, like, uh, simulated combat, which is why I think sports are so popular, competitive team sports. Which yeah. is it's fine. I don't... I, I get that. And I understand that evolution is is the survival of the fittest and that that fitness of survival is the capacity to do horrible things to guarantee your survival including to other members of your species but i also look at 
the the amazing things humans are able to do. I mean, sure. already it's been 50 years since we put people on the moon, and that was yep. only 63 years after we had powered flight for the first time. That's that's tremendous advancement and cooperation, like technological advancement and coordination on an unprecedented scale. And man, if we could right. do that a half a century ago, what what can't we do tomorrow? Like like the future to me looks very bright in terms of what we could do. If, if we just have a vision and then have the will to, to see the vision through. I, I think if the, the internet the internet has to stay alive for society to continue to get on its upward momentum. I know we're kind of running out of time here. We said we were going to try to limit ourselves to about an hour, but I, I do want to talk next time about um, about the value of time. Like we have, you know, sure. it's one of about a hundred topics that we have talked about offline, but that I would like to talk about on the podcast. Uh, just just the value of time as like the you know the only non-renewable commodity and and the significance of the fact that it's the only non-renewable commodity <laughs> I, I think there's a lot to discuss there what's that yeah uh, just the idea that um some people you know, the idea of time being an illusion unique to human you know incarnation it's we value it very highly <laughs> and then it seems like it's just it's something that just goes away so it's it wouldn't surprise me if it is like that <laughs> is like what oh, oh just some you know some when you hold when you value something a whole bunch until your mindset about everything changes and then sometimes stuff falls away and loses importance yeah I, you say time is an illusion and yet without it how do you have any activity uh, sure so I I, I I i don't know i'm just it yeah I, maybe the flow of time is an illusion I mean, there is only one moment, the present. There's no right. past. There's no future. Right. I get that. That's all Buddhism. That's fine. However, however, second law of thermodynamics, when it, wherever you've got increasing entropy, that's the arrow of time. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm saying that that's not an illusion because everything, all the potential energy is going away. We're heading toward an omega point, And that means oh, sure. that <laughs> whether you want to say it's an illusion or not, it's a commodity and you can't make more of it. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. And, 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 you know... I, you could just say, you know, it it might just be a set up time limit on the simulation, but then you know, then it goes into turtles all the way down. It's like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and you know, it could very well be a simulation run like at the very end of time, right before the omega point. Yeah, you know, where it just projected a copy of itself, like a holographic copy of all the way back. You know, with the few remaining little dribs of energy left, and I think you know that. Again, we were talking about the cycles. That's right. Pretty much the ancients. That's just a common story they fall back on. I, you know, I it just. I'm sorry. I'm laughing because it just dawned on me what you said there, that the whole the whole theme, maybe the title of our first season of this podcast, is really it should just be turtles all the way down, <laughs> because oh, we're yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to explore that topic again and again <laughs> for a while <laughs> because it touches on a lot of things. It sort of fits a lot. A lot of things fit that model. It seems like. Yes. Well, and if, the, if it's the nature of reality, that kind of <laughs> right makes sense where you're not, you know, you're just sort of a frame of reference. You're not really at any one point. <laughs> Turtles all the way down. Turtles all the way down. Classic. Um, hey, what do you think? Should we, should we call it? I think it's a pretty good first episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty good, pretty good. Hopefully it'll pick up and get people interested. And... I hope some people are interested. I hope they watch. And by the way, for those that are watching, we're going to we're gonna publish this on a YouTube channel. I don't think we've created it yet. Uh, it's going to be called Probably This Week in Thought. We'll publish it up there. And I think we're going to try to do one a week. Um, although I will say, you know, we can record these fairly quickly in an hour, uh, but it takes me a little longer to do the video editing. So... We're recording them on, I think this is a, a Monday, well, now we're on Tuesday morning, but so if we record it early in the week, it may take me till a few days into the week before I get the video editing done and published, but I will do my best to try to get it edited and published within the week that we record it before the next one is recorded. Um, and, you know, if if occasionally I need a week off, you know, it's just how it goes. It is. Until it, this is a full-time job. Right. Well, that's, <laughs> I mean, no, you make a good point is we're both employed here. We both are working to uh, to live right now, <laughs> and so um, so yeah. Of course, work has to come first. But but I, I I don't know. I enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it. I hope the the viewers enjoy it as much as we do. I hope that some people out there get a kick out of it. Maybe 
Uh, and if you do, you know, if you like what we're doing, drop a comment, post a comment, tell us what, what you like, what you don't like. And if there's like topics you'd like us to discuss, uh, we're pretty open minded, I think, on topics. And uh, I, we could probably do a deep dive on just about anything. So post a comment. Let us know what you'd like to see. Otherwise, we'll try to do it about once a week. And uh, it's the, the channel is going to be called This Week in Thought, and it'll be up on YouTube. Hopefully, uh, within a, a week of it uh, being recorded, it'll be published. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that was great. You got any other closing thoughts or, or comments? or? Uh, yeah, not not really. Just hope it goes well and does what, he me- does what we mean it to do. I, I agree. I hope some people watch it and like it. So let us know. If you like it, you know. Maybe give it, give it a thumbs up or give it a subscribe or whatever. Watch, see what we're doing. Post comments. Let us know what you want to see. All right, cool. Well, that's that's it. I think that's episode one in the in the bag. And we will catch you, catch you next week. Take it easy, everybody. Goodbye.